How you doing? I'm JD, the Media Jack, and welcome to another episode of the Flipside Podcast, episode 462. On today's episode, we're going to hear a little bit later from Carl Wiesen, a great singer-songwriter, an incredible musician from Prince George, British Columbia. He just released a brand new studio album. But first, we're going to talk to a man who, for the most part, is a very positive influence on social media, TikTok specifically. He has over 5 million followers on the app. Now, I say mostly positive because the only negativity this man really brings is, unfortunately, some people who just don't appreciate what he does. He's known as TikTok Jesus. This is Scotty Wartooth on the Flipside Podcast. Uh, full-time, I'm a gardener, but I do work uh, part-time on a karting track, like go-karts and stuff. And I work on the side uh, for a mermaid company. It's like costume entertainment, charity work and that, so a bit of a mix. But, hmm. yeah, gardening full-time. Uh, Cosplay-wise, I've been doing it for about seven years now, I think. I started when I was uh, roughly about 19, and I'm 26 now, so, Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I didn't. I did not expect at all for you to answer gardener. Uh, is this something no. you just fell into? <laughs> is this an interesting? Yeah, I, 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 I actually spent three years in college uh, studying music technology and music, and uh, I couldn't really get the work in the end. There's just not really a lot in my area. The only opportunities I'd have would be to volunteer in a small studio, which by now they're all bust, right. basically. So uh, there wasn't really a lot of opportunity. I've recently. Well, about uh, well, 2019, before the pandemic, I was able to get a uh, voluntary job in a theatre, but it's still voluntary. I can't give the time for too much, so yeah, I kind of fell into gardening work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, working working with your hands, working with the earth, like there's nothing wrong with that. And on top of that, gardening is is something that you get the satisfaction and gratification once the job is finished, because when you're done, you you mm. have something beautiful in front of you. Yeah, it's all right when the the weather's nice at least, but when it's hammering it down, you're working in the mud, picking weeds out of it, it's like, oh, why am I here? <laughs> I could be doing anything else. <laughs> yeah. It's and like, then... I can't just get in the van and take shelter already. Yeah. <laughs> and you uh, work for a a mermaid company and you work and you do charity work. Mm. What is this? Uh, well, the mermaid company is literally just that it's a mermaid company it's, it's a it's a small business uh, full of uh, mermaid performers i've been working for well i've been working with them as a pirate okay. essentially if you think of it like uh, santa's grotto you've got uh, santa there in the chair then you've got maybe the elves around there now the purpose of the elves would be they can be on foot they can walk about and sort of do anything like helping out if they need to and they can interact with kids maybe but they can sort of do more around while santa's stuck with a kid on his lap if you think of it like the mermaid stuck in a pool when they can't really do a lot besides move about in a pool, I can walk about and do whatever I need to. So that's kind of my job there. But I have recently actually uh, come into possession of a mermaid tail. So I'm uh, eventually going to be performing in that with them, uh, assuming I can we can find a place to learn to use the tail because not all pools actually have the license to let you do that. So it's a little difficult. <laughs> Inter interesting. Is it is like a contamination issue? Is it a safety issue? I think it's a safety issue, really, because, uh, I mean, well, for my, my tail, for example, it's only a fabric one, okay. but on the inside, the actual fin itself, uh, you need something on the inside that you basically slip your feet into to basically force your, your legs to use in one go. Mine's made of silicon, which uh, is a bit more, more so for comfort rather than using plastic on my bare feet. But, um, yeah, they are heavy. If I flick that in the air and smacked a child, that could do some serious damage. So I'm I'm assuming that's a safety uh, issue there with the licensing. Not a lasting effect you want to leave on a child. Whap! No, not at all, no. So how long have you... Did we, did we get into this? How long have you been a part of this industry, this community? The Mermaid Group, uh, I joined... A Officially, I think early 2019 or maybe late 2008. No, 2000, uh, late 2018. I think it was actually. Yeah, because I did some small work uh, at, at a pool, and uh, oh, I spent most of uh, 2019 uh, doing festival work with them, which is stressful, but really, actually, it's it's fun work, really. So, yeah. Well, you 
I, I, like the Mermaid Tale is, is a new addition, so you've primarily been mm. doing this as a pirate. Now, you have the yeah. hair, and you have the beard, and you <laughs> have the look. Silly question, but to a point, when's the last time you cut your hair? A couple of weeks ago, actually. Okay, so it's, it's maintained. <laughs> Literally, it's, it, I, I, I hadn't actually cut it since uh, the middle of 2019. It was just getting, like, uh, split ends and stuff, so I had a few inches off. Mm. Doesn't You wouldn't have thought so, but... Yeah, a couple of inches off just to tidy up a little bit. So, yeah. is is this so uh, the long hair and the incredible facial hair? Is this a personal style, and it just happened to fit in with the pirate life? Um, it's a bit of a personal style, but I've kind of kept the face. Usually, um, what I used to have more was like um, you know Will Turner. He has more of a little mustache and a little bit of a soul patch in parts of the Caribbean. Yeah. I used to do that more often, but then I started uh, growing it out a little bit more. And I've kind of stuck with a beard mostly because the whole Jesus sort of content. If I shave that for anything, I've got to wait a while to grow it back before I can make the content again. Right. So I've partially kept it for the Jesus, but I had the long hair anyway. It was partially why I was getting the comparisons in the first place. So right. where so, it came from. <clears throat> like we, we, we can lead right into that. I mean, you, yeah. you have <laughs> broken out massively on the app of TikTok as the and and this is my interpretation so if anyone's going to jump onto this uh blame <laughs> me uh as the north american version of jesus christ and congratulations on 5 million plus <laughs> followers on your main tiktok account and secondly my heart goes out to you for all the backlash and all the hate that you get which is <laughs> utterly stunning <clears throat> <laughs> like you like it just is what it is at this point just <laughs> yeah so uh for anyone who is unaware uh you are nicknamed uh, amongst other nicknames tiktok jesus and you you have a great cosplay as jesus christ it is very much tongue-in-cheek but it is not without it is not with malice you are doing it as an interpretation of someone who appreciates, respects, but also sees the irony in a lot of what modern psychology sees in Jesus Christ. Now, you get some great support, and like five million <clears throat> followers is nothing to snub your nose at, but at the same time, <clears throat> the amount of backlash you get from people <clears throat> who say they're of christian faith <laughs> and they like, don't exactly practice what they preach no uh, and to that's, say the least <laughs> and that's yeah. just it too like turn the other cheek and you know be kind to your neighbors and respect all all thought and every human is in every life is precious mm. is like out the window it's like a little bit of a misunderstanding of what I do, I think, essentially. Because, I mean, uh, yeah, I use uh, Jesus and God for the sort of subject of uh, comedy and humor. Yes. But um, one thing that, like, I think a good, like, half of my followers are religious because they, they notice that uh, none of my content has ever taken a jab at them personally for what they believe in. Yeah. Like, I'm not personally religious myself. I mean, technically, you could say agnostic because we all are in a way. Yeah. But um, I've just never seen a reason to insult anybody for what they believe in. I never insult anyone's intelligence for what they believe in. And that's I've just kept that quite consistent yeah. with uh, my content. So I make it so that religious people can have a laugh if they want to. I've, I've known uh, quite a few pastors online who uh, appreciate my content because they realize I've not been that blunt with it. I've seen a lot of people be quite otherwise, but they just see a white guy dressed as Jesus and they think, this is a mockery of my religion. Like, well, I'm not... No. That's not really the point of the content. No. If you don't like the content, that's entirely fair. I don't I don't entirely blame you, but you don't have to uh, spew this kind of hatred in my direction. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, the, you should see the inboxes I get half the time. I, I was... <laughs> I was sharing one last night. Somebody was saying, you're going to hell. Uh, I'm going to like suck your dead nan's ashes or something. Oh, the old, your nan's ashes hit different. I think, are you are you 13? What? <laughs> it's like, I, I basically had to, I, I, I had to share this. And I had to basically sort of caption this saying, imagine thinking you could scathe TikTok Jesus when I get this kind of abuse on a daily basis in the comments. And I basically have to deal with... I just shrug off hundreds of these, like, for breakfast. <laughs> like, 
If you're gonna insult me, do it properly, not like a schoolboy. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Let's just dig a little deeper into this. Um, and I'll I'll start with uh my background is um, I'm agnostic. My father was Jehovah's Witness. My mother Catholic. Uh, my father's second wife uh, Mormon. My father's third wife Christian. <laughs> oh wait, no, I got that backwards. My father's second wife was Christian. My father's third wife was Mormon. I had a couple of buddies back in uh, elementary school and high school. They were uh, devout Christians. I even uh, had friends who would tell me about their religion being Muslim and Sikh. I mean. Like I, I grew up in a family of acceptance, and hence I'm agnostic. I'm not, I'm not malicious about it. I'm not angry about it. I'm not pointing a finger at other people, going like "You're wrong. You're wrong." You know, blah blah blah. It's just I accept who I am, and coming from a family that has many different beliefs and many different backgrounds, I've accepted that people can be at peace with each other while having their yeah. own beliefs. You... That's the sort of religion I really like, to be honest. Like I've seen so many religious, like, I've seen so many sort of atheists who get really blunt about it, talk about how horrible a religion is, how it should be abolished. I think no, I don't think it needs to be abolished. I think that I, I think as an atheist myself, I think that would be rather pointless for me to try and do myself because I think I've seen uh, some of the some uh, religious people I know have been some of the loveliest people I've known, and I've known some other people who are the complete polar opposite. But um, I don't necessarily think the root cause of the negativity is the religion itself. I think uh, some people just use it as the excuse for it. So rather than me trying to, uh, like, attempting to just get rid of religion, it's, it's always going to be a thing. It's going to be there after I die. I think I'd rather call out the bad side of it and just promote the positive side of it. Like, have you seen that video where... Um, there's a, there's a little boy who's about to get um, baptised in a big little pool thing. And uh, before the, the priest can even do it, he just dips his own head in it. He's just so excited. And yes, he just yes, dips did, his own... Yes. It's That is just so... <laughs> it's so adorable. It's like, I challenge you to watch that video and not smile. That is the kind of stuff I love to promote. Yeah. Like, this is just like... No, it, As, a... I'm not even religious myself. It's just I just love watching this sort of this. This, this is the kind of stuff I I just I just love to see. I want to see more of that. So that that sort of thing yeah. is like it's genuine. It's pure. It's excitement. It is wholesome, right? Like the, yeah. the kid was the the child was like just absolutely just over the moon excited to be a part and move forward in his beliefs and his spirituality and so yeah it was mm. i remember seeing that they're just like yeah you can't help but smile at stuff stuff yeah like that, right? it's it's just <laughs> perfect i think <laughs> <laughs> now did you grow up uh in a agnostic family or in a religious family None of my family have ever really been that religious. I think in the UK, it's um, it's like a very different story with religion to America. I think, uh, like, I can't remember who it was, uh, what sort of percentage of America it was, of, of, of somewhat religious. But in the UK, it's while it is basically a Christian country, not a lot of people individually are that religious these days. There are Christians, mostly, I think. But um, it's just, they teach about it in the primary schools, and then it's like, once you grow up, it's like, there's just nothing really forced on you unless it's an individual family itself. So, no, there, there's there's very little around here that uh, really has that much influence. Yes, we've got the whole sort of God save the Queen yes. and that, but it, that's just tradition, really. Yes. It's it's just, there's very little influence these days, so. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you uh, that in North America, both Canada and the United States, the religious following, primarily being of Christian and Catholic, has been dwindling over the past couple of years uh, to a point mm. where it's it's actually troubling and worrisome for a lot of churches. They're seeing lesser and lesser numbers. Uh, and it's because uh, many different reasons, but it's primarily because the people who grew up in a generation where it was it was just a fact of life it was just what you did you went to church you believed in god you you read the bible they can't seem to convince the younger generation to follow suit for mm -hmm. their own reasons so in north america both canada and the united states like the following has been dwindling over the past couple of years which is i've seen um yeah, I've seen a fair few people sort of give their views on why they left the church, and it's hard to really bring that up without uh, sounding too blunt on it, because they've had some very blunt criticisms of it. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, for some of it, it's. Uh, I think there was one guy I saw recently who was talking about how um, he felt like the church had been dishonest with him because yeah. when he started looking into, say, evolution, what the way he put it was that the church that he went to had just completely misrepresented what it was even about and how it even worked. Yes. And so for him walking away from it and then learning the science all over again, it for him was like readjusting to the entire world as that's not what he thought it was. Yeah. And I think there's, I think there's a lot of different uh, contributing factors into why the numbers are going down. But I, I can actually yeah. tell you personally, there's a couple of close friends that I have that have had almost that exact same experience. But again, like yeah. each, each to their own. I mean, the, the the whole point is is to better yourself. That is the entire point. If you're not bettering yourself, no mm-hmm. matter what your belief or spirituality or just lifestyle, if you're not bettering yourself, you're not becoming a better human for yourself, your 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 inner circle, your friends, your family, your coworkers, or just people in general, then in my opinion, I really don't see a point. Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> I mean, that that is the side of religion I, I, I appreciate, really. Like, I think that there's... There's plenty in the Bible you can take as inspiration regardless. Like, even if you didn't want to take it literally, you could still take it like Shakespeare for inspiration. You could still, yes. there's still plenty you could pick up out of Jesus um, to inspire you, like, in life regardless. So, yeah, like. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, let's diverge from the heavy stuff here. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> when did you start TikTok and why did you start TikTok? Early 2019. February or March roundabout. It was mostly just because of cosplay, really. I mean, I was mostly going to the Comic Cons and all that, and I kept getting told it was really good for cosplay. I originally downloaded it uh, late 2018, mm. but I couldn't work out the the I couldn't work out the app, so I deleted it originally. And then after oh, really? a few months, I, yeah, <laughs> and after a few months, I got it back again, and um, yeah, I started doing cosplay stuff on it. And um, after a while, because I was doing Jesus for um, Comic Con anyway, like mm. it was something like my friends had spent um, about a year trying to persuade me to do it. And for about a year, I kept saying, "No, no, it's a silly idea. I want to work on more serious sort of content more." And um, <clears throat> after about a year, I just thought, "All right, fine, I'll I'll do it. I'll 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 get a I'll get a cheap fancy dress costume and I'll do it." So I did it, and I had never had as much fun as I did that day. <laughs> really? <laughs> I met, um, you know uh, the band uh, Cradle of Filth at all? Yes. You know that there was a photo that went around. It was a, G- it was a picture of a Jesus at a music festival next to a guy with a t-shirt saying, Jesus is a... I'm not going to say that word just <laughs> in case, but you know exactly what I'm referring to, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Danny Filth was there signing at this convention, so I met him in the Jesus costume and uh, we had a photo and he shared this photo on, on, on every social media platform they had. You I can, know. you might, you might still be able to Google this actually. If you see like a Danny Filth meets Jesus, a Comic Con, you might find it. I think there, there might not be many articles these days. It was just a random sort of small thing. And I think some of them were based on a Twitter sort of thing, which I don't think is even there anymore, but the articles are still there. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I did that, and I kind of just kept it up for a while, and uh, for a while I was just known as the Jesus of Comic-Con in England. Okay. Then uh, then TikTok came along, and I, was gonna, I wasn't intending to do Jesus for it. Really? Then eventually people started suggesting, oh, you should do your Jesus for it. But I was like, uh, it, was, it was a whole different thing. I'm, I'm putting it online on the internet for a yes. bigger audience. Like, is that something I should be doing? What even would I do? Is that, what's the response going to be? So I did a random one, and um, <clears throat> the feedback was actually very positive. The views came flooding in, and I thought, like, okay, I might do a couple more like this if it mm. works. And um, I just kept going and going. And next thing you know, I'm ne- I'm known as the TikTok, the, the guy on TikTok <laughs> who dresses like Jesus. The and amount, <laughs> the amount of detours and Roblox and the adventure to get to that point where you're. Finally, like, yeah. Like, All right, I'll give it a shot, and then <laughs> it's like I still talk to that group of people who originally uh, got me to do the costume in the first place, and we still have a laugh about. It. Like, like, remember that time when, like, uh, like we kept pestering you to do Jesus, and you didn't even want to do it, and now you've got five million followers sitting on TikTok because of it. <laughs> oh my goodness! Of, of of the feedback, like you, you, I, I, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that you comments and DMs and all that stuff. 
like, yes, the negativity is there. Yes, there is a, a mob that just does not appreciate what you do and cannot see the humor and the light in what you do. But are there, there has to be like a lot of positive things, like comments to just kind yes. of take your breath away. Yes, um, I've had, uh, for the last year, I've had a lot of comments, actually, uh, from people basically thanking me for the content I made, because they've expressed how um, my content actually helped them a lot through the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people suffering depression, feeling suicidal, basically, yeah. and I've had a lot of these kind of people messaging me, or, or just even just commenting on my, status, on my, 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 my videos and that, just saying this. And uh, even, like... Um, because uh, of the fact I'm 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 very pro sort of LGBT, and I don't really tolerate uh, when people start commenting the negativism and that sort of stuff on on there. Like I don't like to sort of piggyback on like pride and LGBT, but at the same time, because I know that my content does attract the very anti sort of LGBT sort of crowd, they're kind of I'm forcing happy. your hand. <laughs> yeah, as I, I I occasionally occasionally it can make some good content. To just tell them where to go, essentially. And uh, it's like, because I, I made some videos last year, I, I just couldn't believe the outrage I caused with some of that. I did, um, it was one, it was it was an audio from Grey's Anatomy with uh, it was like a couple, I think, who have a, a gay uh, daughter. Uh, and um, the mother doesn't like it, the, the husband's basically saying, like, I don't care if she's gay, I care if she's loved, I care if she's happy, and that's what you should care about. I did this with the two friends who were, at the time, a couple, uh, two girls. It was just me, as Jesus, having a rant. I don't care if they're gay, I care if they're happy and loved. Right. And there were so many people who got angry about this, and it's just like, calm down, like, what is the problem? But I've even done some videos where I've even gone and like done, done some research in the Bible about the whole sort of anti-gay sort of things, like pointing out the contradictions with it to make content out of. Like they, they always tend to point, they always tend to bring up like um, uh, Leviticus eighteen twenty-two. So well, I mean Leviticus doesn't even apply to Christians. The Book of Leviticus was about it was the six hundred six hundred and thirteen commandments for the the people of God, the Jews. That's got nothing to do with the Christians. So when they bring up that one, it's like, do you even know what Leviticus is about? <laughs> You're the one who claims to like be reading the Bible, and you don't even know what this part of the Bible is. <laughs> and then when I say when I say, when I say Jesus never mentioned homosexuality, they say, yes, he did. Here's uh, Corinthians. Corinthians has nothing to do with Jesus. Leviticus. Leviticus was pre-Jesus. <laughs> it was before Jesus. This was the sort of stuff that he was supposed to be obeying. Romans, this, this, and this. And then they bring up like um, one passage when they say about when Jesus is talking about how um, a, a boy will go into a man, eventually he will find a woman and leave his family to start his own. Apparently this is an anti-gay passage. No, it's not. He's just talking about ba like simple family values. He's not condemning anything else. Wait, okay, so... No, again, God, I'm agnostic. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just trying to track here. Okay, so I'm agnostic. I've never heard. I'm, I'm just beating the hell out of my microphone over this. <laughs> Ooh, okay, here we go. So a a boy will say say that quote again. It was something about how um, like Jesus was just discussing with people how uh, adult boys will eventually grow up to adulthood. They will eventually find a woman and leave their own family to start anew. Essentially, it was something along the lines of that. That just sounds and, like growing um, up. That just sounds like yeah. growing up. Yeah, it basically it leaves out um, the idea of like a, a a gay relationship, but it's not a condemnation of that no. in any way. But it, 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 yeah. it's it, it, it's it's the wording. It's the trend. It's it's the interpretation. Yeah, it is. I think some you know, people are just a bit too keen to find something out of that to make words out of. But then, like, it, I, I've noticed how a lot of people these days are starting. It, like, it's starting to become more common knowledge of things that, like, uh, like, the word homosexual wasn't in the Bible until 1946. I was going to do another video on this recently because somebody uh, touched on it, basically saying it was 1946 by Germany. It was like almost. Uh, the the word for homosexual was first coined in Germany in 1869, but it wasn't Germany that actually first had it in their Bibles. That was uh, it was an American company called Biblica that bought the rights to their copies because there wasn't a massive following over there. They're the ones who put that translation in there originally. That was it. It was an English thing. Mm. So it's funny how yeah, Germany basically coined the word first, but they weren't even the first ones to have that word in the Bible. It was. 
and, and it's like decades the west uh, centuries yeah. you know millennia later do, do you find it entertaining that you've become so versed in in uh, bible study religious study because of your cosplay i do find it kind of funny but i genuinely do find it quite fascinating like um I think I've, I've learned, in general, I, I like to learn about all sorts of things. I quite like history myself, but at the same time, I like to sort of jump to new subjects. And I like learning about religion um, as literature, essentially. I think there's a lot that's fascinating about the Bible and beyond, because there are books that never made it into the Bible, right. essentially. And it's, it's fascinating to learn about those um, books, like the, uh, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, which not a lot of people tend to talk much about, because it basically involves Jesus as a five-year-old killing people. But, what? 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 Yeah, it's. It, I mean, the books of um, uh, the Gospels of Thomas were never exactly uh, regarded very highly by the scribes or anything like that. But um, they, they, they are still books uh, that exist. So they are def They are still worth a read. <laughs> I'm learning way too much about this. <laughs> just, <laughs> just this wonderful conversation, honestly. I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We've already been chatting for uh, close to a half, or, or just over half an hour, uh, and I really do appreciate the time you, you're giving me today. You were talking about uh, other interests, and uh, before the pandemic hit, you were into, uh, you said music study? I, uh, in college, uh, I studied uh, music and music technology originally, yeah. So, are you a musician? I've been playing the guitar for about 12 years now. 12 roughly. years? Yeah, I play a bit of the Native American flute, a uh, small bit of the mandolin, uh, and, uh, well, I tried a bit of the keyboards and the keyboard broke. <laughs> so <laughs> I, didn't get I, didn't get I didn't get far in that. My little brother kept carrying it to himself, trying to try and practice himself, and he kept banging it on the doorway as he kept uh, uh, leaving the room. So eventually, it just stopped working. So okay, you play rhythm, lead, bass, acoustic, electric. What do you play? I suppose more um, rhythm these days. Back in the day, I, I joined a fair few bands, and I was mostly lead at the time, but I was still quite young. I was um, I was never. There's a lot of people who play the instruments these days. They're very they're very um, keen to be like the next Eddie Van Halen, so they take the shortcuts and all that. I was never, I was never really that much of in a rush to go through solos, so I, I kind of kept at a steady pace. I remember a point uh, years ago when I was with a few friends, we went around someone's house and there was an acoustic guitar lying around, mm -hmm. and me and the other guy who played the guitar, we just started like taking turns, like sort of, almost like a duel, just sort of showing off like what we could do. He was going through like a Pantera, like Dimebag solos and stuff. And I just, uh, for my, for my warm-up, I just start playing Metallica, That Was Just Your Life. It's like, I used to be able to just warm up that, that one, like, a little bit faster than the original. And he was just, like, staring me, like, how can you play that one? Practice? Like, I couldn't play any of the solos that he could, yeah. but he couldn't play that that one little riff. <laughs> like, <laughs> but that's just... It, yeah. You know what? <laughs> Interest, practice, skill set. I mean, like, if... if Patience. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, if you were more interested or just were enticed by a different solo, then you would have practiced that one over and over and over again, right? So yeah, I've both. seen so many people try and play Crazy Train solo and just simplify it just to pass off as being able to play. It's like that's not the same thing. Dude. That's <laughs> I mean, you go on a live forever. stage. <laughs> you want to you want to go in, in a live stage in front of people. You don't want to play it like that. <laughs> like, you don't want to record it like that because when you listen to a recording like that, people will pick up that thing like a like a microscope. Yeah, oh well, yeah. So yeah. you you do it properly, or you don't do it at all. Yeah, an, an audio trained ear or even a sound engineer will be like ah 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 ah. ah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what other interests do you have? What what is it that Scotty does that uh, you know to blow off steam or just have fun or anything? Um, I mean, I, I do a fair bit of gaming or just watching any sort of series, whichever these days. I mean, I, I stream on Twitch as well, but um, yeah, I, I quite like I quite uh, quite like to be, to be a little bit laid back at home. I, I do cosplay, obviously, on the side with different sort of things, but uh, I'm not quite in the stage of like doing armor and stuff, so um, I'm not quite as crafty as I could be, I suppose. So. Skill set again, <clears throat> different skill set. <laughs> That's all it yeah. is. Right? Maybe oh. one day, but yeah, uh, yeah. seven years of uh, cosplay, not quite at the armor stage just yet. Just buying the pieces. Yeah, the most popular question and most frequent 
lightly asked question when it comes to cosplay. It's like, how do I start cosplay? Just, just start. Like, it doesn't matter yeah. if you build something or you buy something. It is cosplay. It's like, I mean, your first cosplay is never going to be amazing, really. It's like, it's going to look probably, it's probably going to look bad. I mean, my first one looked terrible. It was an attempt at the scarecrow, and I look back at it, it now, and it's cringe. <laughs> but like, that that is, um, it's like. Life is like the best sort of teacher. Failure, failure is your best teacher because you know where you've gone, you've gone wrong in that, and that's yeah. where you uh, build on. You don't necessarily need a guide for it. You just throw yourself out there because you go to an event. It doesn't matter if you don't like your costume because there's going to be a lot of people who are in the exact same position. You throw yourself out there, get a costume on, and if you like the environment, you like the people around, you like the event, if you want to actually do the costumes for it, you can keep at it. You can do some simple ones. Or you can maybe learn to build up, and if that's how, if that's the hobby you like, yeah, you start somewhere and you build up. It's amazing where you can go. Yeah. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. But the the whole key is starting and just going from there. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Sometimes like some people sort of want like a friend to go with because they don't want to go on their own, and I get it. Like it's yeah. not it's not always easy having a friend to go with. Like it like for for people in the sort of the geek sort of community, it can be hard enough finding the friends in the local area. It's hard to socialize in that sort of sense for some people. So yeah, I get that. Yeah, we live in a world where there's a pandemic. So this is a question that I started to ask my guests. Uh, mm. Have you gotten your shot? Uh, no, I've uh, heard nothing about my uh, my shots just yet. Oh. There's a bit, of, there's a sort of um, thing sort of going around at the moment because um, I mean um, it's it's mostly the older people who've been getting it first, and then it's people like in the care homes, maybe people with um, uh, immune compromised uh, immune systems. Uh, yeah, I'm 26 myself, so I'm still a bit young for the thing that they're there. Uh, Health wise, I've got no sort of problems there, but I am uh, mildly autistic. And there is uh, something sort of going around at the moment because of, of our country. Uh, our government did actually put some um, autistic people on the DNR list for do not resuscitate in the case of COVID. What? Which has left a lot of people like myself for wondering, uh, are we going to be at the back of the queue? Is that how they see us? Or That's a little... Fuck a up. little messed up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's, our, that's our government for you. Holy Christ. Uh... Wow, <laughs> I I had no idea. That's um, is this mm. Brian? Wait, I, I'm probably gonna get the politician wrong. Is this Johnson? Boris Johnson, yeah. Boris Johnson, yeah. Wow, wow, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have nothing. Uh, that is that is insane. All right, well, yeah, it wasn't something that made uh, mainstream news. It was never discussed on media for. Uh... Probably uh, obvious reasons there, but yeah, the, the articles were out there and, uh, wow. okay. yeah. Oh, shocking. Okay. Okay. I... Moving on from that, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm broken. I am utterly broken. That is... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, moving on. Let's move on, please. Uh... <laughs> you're feeling healthy. You're feeling good. You're not sure when you're going to get your vaccination, but you hope to get one soon. Do you have mm. any plans uh, with the pandemic in mind and the end of the pandemic in mind? Uh, what plans, like event-wise? Uh, Events, -wise, personal really? projects, anything like that. What can someone look forward to seeing uh, from you in the near future? Well, our um, restrictions are being lifted at the moment, so I do have uh, a few festivals I'm going to be working with at the Mermaid Group. Cool. Uh, there is the Mermaid content to look forward to uh, eventually when I can learn how to swim in it. So I've got some collabs I want to do with it. I am hoping, though, to be able to travel to America some point for Florida. I was supposed to be there this year. Mm. Um, there was going to be a Megacon. Okay. But then the pandemic happened, and of course we couldn't leave the country. And if I did, I would get a five thousand pound fine. Yeah, not worth so, it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, either way, I've still got to wait until I can get my vaccine before I can leave the country. Anyway, so it might not be till next year at this rate. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
I mean, it, it's all it's all steps, right? I mean, like I know mm. that in Canada <clears throat> there is certainly a lot of uh, restrictions and lockdown. Like I can't leave my province. I can't even leave specific parts of my province. Uh, or mm. travel to specific parts of my province. I, I live very much in the north, and I can't head south for 500 kilometers because anything beyond that, I will literally be stopped and be told to turn around. So, But, mm. I mean, here's hoping that things move forward. Uh, now, you, you, you do game on Twitch as well as you have content on TikTok. Uh, the mermaid thing, I actually have a question from a mutual friend of ours, uh, and the question oh, yeah. is... Uh, what mermaid tail did you decide on and have you come up with a mermaid character name yet? Uh the tail was uh known it was called the Anubis from uh Mer Taylor. <clears throat> That's the one I went for. Uh, I have made some videos with the tail already. I didn't officially decide on a name because I'm not entirely sure what we're doing with that at the moment because the the girls that I work with for mermaids in general um they're able to just use their own names like Lily and that like they, they just work fine as mermaids but I couldn't help but just think Scott <laughs> just Scott the mermaid does that really so you could like, I mean <laughs> it's it's really um it's like does, does this really work like am I gonna start calling myself Aquaman or something uh I mean, okay, so I, like... I, 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 I did uh, I did put up a video out there like saying like um okay so a lot of you know I got a mermaid tail but um, I haven't really thought of a net like I've been asking have you got a name I haven't really thought of that so I yeah. want to hear your thoughts below two conditions one I'm not going with Mer Jesus <laughs> two Jesus. and two I'm not going with Fishy McFishface. <laughs> But that's a classic. And, and I knew that the top rated comment was going to be a funny one. And of course, the top rated one was the Messiah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's a little on the nose, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately trying to keep that separate from the whole Jesus thing. But I knew I was never going to be able to escape that. Yeah. Just, and everyone's making the jokes like, but what, how are you going to be a mermaid to swim if you're going to keep walking on the water all the time? Like, I love your fans. <laughs> they bring up. I do, I do. I do as well. But <laughs> you yeah. know, I like. I, I, I at the beginning, I, I told you, like, I wore this short for you. It. Uh, yeah. Tis just a flesh wound. In Monty Python. I. I, I know my you're favorite a fan. movies there. Oh yeah, Holy Grail is great. There is something to be said for the mermaid named Scott. <laughs> yeah, I just never really thought um, that would really pass off as a mermaid name. So it, they, there had been talks of merging it with the, the Barracuda pirate character. I do though, like it's, it. The, the, the tail makes it look like a darker sort of theme, so it could have been the same sort of character merged, perhaps, or yeah. maybe <laughs> he did it. Maybe, about. maybe he, maybe he did it with the mermaid, and that's his kid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that would work. But it, um, it, it, it's 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 all about how you present it, I guess. Right? We'll work on something with that. We'll <laughs> we'll we'll work something out. <laughs> okay. Where can someone find you on social media, and uh, how can they be a uh, a support, and how can they, you know, just be a fan, a proper mm -hmm. fan? Oh, well, I keep the same username on all my platforms. So there's um, a TikTok, of course, uh, Twitch. Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, which is mostly just YouTube Shorts and TikTok. But um, I think the, the best way to support me as a creator would be the Twitch, because uh, while a lot of people like to send gifts on TikTok, they are very greedy when it comes to the money and stuff on there. The Creator Fund, you get very little on there, uh, and the gifts, you you basically uh, you they, they basically take like seventy percent of all that money that people have spent on the gifts. So I've never said like I've never asked for gifts. I've never said don't send them. But I always say, if you want to give any sort of support, there is a PayPal or Cash App in the link, right. which at least that way your money's not going to disappear. I'm not asking for it, but I, if you don't want your money to disappear, that's the best option. Yeah. But as a creator, you, I think uh, one thing I've been mainly trying to focus on for that sort of thing is Twitch, because it's just that to support me financially, it's just so much better. Like, and it's it's just so much easier for me to work with. If I go live on TikTok, I've got like possibly up to 600 people watching hundreds of comments going yeah. by the same sort of comments and uh it's it's mentally draining with twitch i can play i can actually get more involved with the um viewers having more of a conversation with them and that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just like it so much more on there the, the the chat scroll is also it's larger it's it's right yes there. you can control <clears throat> it easy and um 
Yeah, I mean, you're also kicking back, relaxing, playing. What was the most recent game you played? Most recent? Uh, I think that was The Crew 2, but I've been focusing on that, that Resident Evil uh, Village lately. Ah, uh, yes. That's, that's a fair bit of that. Yes. I did uh, a couple of playthroughs, and now I've got the machine gun with unlimited ammo, so I'm just calling those streams, uh, Jesus has got a gun. <laughs> so I'm just, going, I'm, just going, I'm just going Rambo Jesus on uh, everything now. Oh my goodness. Thanks for your time, Scott. All good. <laughs> Let me just... Another mid-episode advertisement. Who'd have thought? Well, I'm JD the Media Jack, and if you enjoy watching this or listening to this on all the audio podcast sites, you can help support me. You can help support the show and show your appreciation and even be a part of the show if you want through Patreon. Just search for The Media Jack on Patreon. The lowest tier is $1.50 a month. The highest tier will get you a credit as executive producer on the show. Every episode, your name will be a part of the show. But it's completely up to you. Everything from Patreon goes to help out what the show is. So without further ado, our second interview for today is Carl Wiesen. Just a quick note, <laughs> if you ever want to have a conversation with someone, Facebook is probably the last resort when it comes to video and audio quality. So I apologize in advance, but it's still a great quality interview with an incredible talent. This is Carl Wiesen on the Flipside Podcast. I'm uh, 28 years, eight years old now, just celebrated my birthday last week. Uh, I've been in Prince George for a decade. So it's, I'm originally from the Bulkley Valley in uh, Kitwonga, BC. Mm -hmm. Moved down here right after I graduated high school. And yeah, I've been here for a decade. And Prince George has been really welcoming to me. And it's been a great, uh, great place for me to, to grow up and learn. And I'm currently working at uh, CKPG TV, where you also work. <laughs> you, and I are, you and I are coworkers, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but before we were coworkers, you were actually uh, my bass guitar coach. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So, like, that speaks just like a tiny bit of the talent that you have. How many instruments can you pick up at a whim and play anything? <laughs> I don't know the number. If it has frets, I can probably figure it out. So I, I play guitar, bass, and drums. I had piano lessons when I was super young, and I just I never got into it. My mom would try to bribe me with chocolate bars when I was like five or six to <laughs> play in piano lessons, uh, and it just didn't work. And when uh, when I was around uh, 12 or 13, my father kind of noticed at one of his uh, friend's places we were over for a visit, he took out a guitar, and I was... You know, amazed by this Stratocaster. It's just a like, regular old guitar. So he right. bought me in turn a bass guitar, and that started started me on my trek in music. So you you were just in awe of a Stratocaster, which <laughs> yeah. is a lead, and yeah. your father went, "Well, here's a bass." <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I think it was a really good thing. I, I credit it a lot for for my my timing, and uh, it really helped me because bass is is one instrument that'll help you. To, delve off into guitar and into drums, right? Because the timing that comes from being that kind of middleman between the two mm -hmm. really helps you with other instruments down the way. So so what instruments, how many instruments do you currently own? Uh, how many instruments do I currently own? Ooh, I got six guitars, I got a little skeleton drum kit, and yeah, probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous question to ask a musician. How many do you own? <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, you start off with a bass guitar and uh, yeah. you know a little bit of uh, with bribery, piano lessons and whatnot. It was that when you knew like you know this is this is what I want to I want to involve myself in music. Yeah, a hundred percent. When I when I first started uh, getting involved with uh, with playing bass and and instantly meeting uh, kids at school and starting bands and and, and playing, you know, at least five hours a day, mm. uh, I really kind of identified with that, and that's what I del I dove right into. Yeah. Yeah. So when was your first band, and what was it? Oh, first band was with um, some other folks probably know in this town, uh, J P Moldo. Uh, the lead singer of Studio 720. Oh, yeah? We went to the same high school in Hazleton, BC. And I think it was a band called 15 to Freedom, and we played alt rock. Very <laughs> alternative rock that <laughs> went crazy metal, and then went crazy pop. That was the first group. And uh, it was really cool. I think on the first day of high school, we formed that band. 
<laughs> wow, <laughs> off to a flying start. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So do you prefer to play, like, during that time, do you prefer to play uh, your own originals, or do you also do you play covers? You know, I, like, I've been in cover bands in the past. Uh, recently, though, uh, for the last last two years, I've really uh, nailed down to just working on solo stuff. Um, mm. In April of last year, I put out a... Uh, my first EP uh, titled Grandpa's Hat, which was just basement uh, kind of recordings, nothing, uh, nothing fancy, but I really wanted to, to focus uh, on on performing originals and creating originals and and, mm-hmm. and going down that line. I do enjoy playing uh, a, a couple good covers uh, if I'm doing a show, though. Yeah, <laughs> something to get people dancing. Now, now, like like, like I st- stated before, like uh, you ended up being my bass teacher, and I. You know, the pandemic is no excuse. I I, I wish I would have uh, picked up the guitar more often than I do, but still, like I I like you, like this is fun, and you know I'm having a good time with this. And you know, for me, I'm nowhere near anywhere of creating my own original work. I'm just strictly just playing what you've taught me and the in the exercises you've taught me, as well as a lot of covers. Was uh, teaching. A interest of yours? Is it a passion of yours? Was it something just to kind of help make ends meet? Yeah, kind of all, all of the above. I was always teaching uh, since since high school, uh, mm-hmm. where I got to like an intermediate level, just teaching beginners, and uh, we had a, a strings guitar class, which I kind of TA'd in and helped out with. But yeah, it was it was an opportunity to do something that I love. I love working with working with people and also music, of course, my main passion. And it just it was it kind of made sense. And then I got uh, I taught at Dreamland, uh, Jeremy Stewart's music school for a couple of years, I think in 2017, and then started working at Sound Factory. And that was just a, a really 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 great fit. And I started to really learn uh, to love teaching. It's it's a really amazing thing when you can have a pupil and have somebody that's really uh, succeeding and growing under your tutelage. It also teaches you a, a lot. I learned a lot from teaching, from learning from the other side, right? So my yeah. theory drastically grew from teaching because it had to. <laughs> <laughs> and just from going through the material so many times, you kind of I don't know, you kind of see more things from that right. side. Well, you know, it, the only the only experience that I can relate to is when you and I sat down in the studio together. Uh, keep in mind, this is pre-pandemic. Um, I, I would bring in songs that uh, you either had forgotten about or didn't even know existed, and every single time, like I, you're like, I, I like this. Where'd this come from? <laughs> <laughs> and Sorry. it's amazing to see you break something down because, like, I'll bring in, for example. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Graveyard Shift, Battle Tapes. And a great song, it kind of hasn't really hit any sort of charts, but like has an incredible bass line to it. Oh. And I played it for you, and you immediately started breaking it down. You identified the rhythm, the bass, and the lead, as well as the the timing of it. And like, is this, like, do you, do you, do you learn by ear or is this just like a lot of experience of just recognizing what's going on in a song? Uh, a lot of experience. Yeah. And then, and then when breaking it down, finding the key and all that just uh, from ear. But I, uh, I'm going to say that I do not have uh, that great of an ear. You know, if I'm listening to a song, I'll pick up uh, an instrument and I'll just hit a random note and just try to try to find it and take me a second. Once I found it, my experience and everything can kind of, uh, pull me through and see what uh, what the song is working with. Yeah, you ever get stumped? Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There's some there's some weird switches, and you just kind of get frustrated. And they're like, okay, I'm looking up the tabs for this. <laughs> <laughs> there's no shame in looking for help, right? No exactly. shame. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you had an opportunity to uh, work with uh, some people that have surprised you, and you know? Have you had an opportunity to work with anyone you look up to? Uh, yes, I, I've had some amazing students over the the years I was uh, teaching teaching music. Mm-hmm. And one thing that really surprised me is age is not really a factor. I mean, it really depends on the person. But I had uh, students from the age of five up to seventy five, and I had uh, one of my favorite drum students. I think he was six years old, and he was like. John Bonham, like he would, he do most Zeppelin songs, like intricate sixteenth note patterns, 
yeah, he was a, an amazing student. And, uh, yeah, I kind of get surprised every time when I see anybody grow, even if it's a little bit of growth, they're putting in that work. As for people I look up to, I mean, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of a lot of great people that uh, that I, I know and that I've I've met through teaching, uh, but no, nobody in particular, like nobody uh, nobody with a higher musicality of me is coming to me for lessons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you at least like you, you? You must be inspired by other artists, right? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and who? What, what? What would be your like top five of? I I would like to just be in the presence of blank. Oh, that's a tough one, man. I, if I had the chance to, a number one bass player, probably Pino Palladino, amazing, amazing bass player. It's just so w once you get to a level, you play with any of these musicians. It's, uh, they're absolutely amazing. And mm. one thing. Uh, I notice when when listening or uh, gathering inspiration or jamming with amazing musicians, it's all about the basics. Like it's not like they're doing. It's not about all, all the time, right? It's just how honed in their timing is and right. and the basics. Uh, yeah, it, it's Ballad, almost. You know, sorry, it, it's it's almost as though they're holding their own lungs in their hand. It's just a yeah. matter of breathing through the instrument. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's there's so much to name though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> number one bass player is Pino, though for sure. Yeah. yeah. If if we were to look through your uh, mold device or your CD rack or anything like that, and like, what would we find? Ooh, a, a large array of uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of things. Uh, of course, like most people, also I'm a big classic rock guy. Uh, most recent uh, acquirement of the collection was a couple Zappa vinyls because Frank Zappa is, I don't know, it's a crazy amalgamation of, of what he did and it's really interesting to expand your uh, expand your horizons to kind of listen to what's going on. Crazy arrangements, crazy music. Um, lots of blues. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, of course. Mm. Huge, huge fan. And uh, what else? I gotta look over my record collection. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, you're like me. Like I can see my record collection right there. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it 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 varies, right? Um, I like listening to a lot of different jazz, world music to try to get get out of my box. Yeah, it just kind of it just kind of varies uh, on the day. For inspiration, uh, I like diving into something like I was just talking about different things. Uh, Herbie Hancock, uh, getting into some funk. As that's one thing. When I'm trying to write write songs currently, I'm I'm just writing. I don't know for what project or for what album, but I'm trying to make them a lot funkier. I want to give them a, a kind of a dance feel to them. So yeah, we'll see how that works out. Now you mentioned earlier that you released an EP last year. Now and, you know we you just released a, a brand new EP, not like a week, two weeks ago. And um, like the the social media push has been impressive, quite frankly. Tell me about what this is all about. So yeah, the new EP uh, titled Maylong uh, was recorded at Pulp City Music uh, by Connor Pritchard's recording studio. And it's my first uh, studio release, and there are four songs on it, and they are some of the songs were written recently, and some of the songs were written in 2013. So they're it's kind of a collection of songs that I've been holding on to and and putting together and trying to uh, put out for this release, and it's it's been great. The the response I've gotten from everybody has been uh, awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Put it out on Good Egg Records, which is Prince George's local record label, run by Britt Meyer Hoffer. Yeah, it's just a, a really neat collections of song, uh, collection of songs that I've been I've been waiting to put out, and I've been itching to do a studio release for a while now, a proper radio ready studio release, and uh, really happy with how it turned out. What was that like for you? The the release or no uh, no working in the studio and getting that release oh, all done. It was amazing. It was it was during COVID though, so. Ah yes, it was interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I would I would imagine you're already locked away in a studio anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I did all the instruments myself uh, and, and vocals, and my girlfriend Sarah came down and did a couple piano parts and back uh, backup vocals to the whole EP. Hmm. It was awesome, but it was very tiring. Like I booked off two weeks to record it with Connor, and we'd go in there every day, and 
because we have to lay bed tracks, and then I got to play drums with those bed tracks. You got to do all this stuff, and and the setting up of equipment and trying new things. You're like, okay, what's next? Oh yeah, bass for the song. Okay, <laughs> it's pretty exhausting after a while. By the end of it, we were we were pretty happy that uh, that it had come to a close. I think for future releases, though, I'm gonna look at hiring some local great musicians to uh, to do some recordings. It's just uh, it's easier to capture that energy and also. Uh, for time, effective time. <laughs> you, you don't want to be dragging your feet, going like I'm chasing my dream. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, someone else in that same scenario, in that same situation. I can't help but think of Dave Grohl, the very first uh, demo, and subsequently the very first album for the Foo Fighters was all by him. But uh, like he did that on purpose. He did that because he didn't want basically word getting out that hey former nirvana member is releasing an album he just he did it for his own peace of mind and he did it for his own uh interests but at the same time like he made no bones about it that he was exhausted by the time he was done yeah yeah i'll tell you one thing's really nice is uh, i've never done this before but working with a uh, an engineer who was also producing it's really, really important to have somebody with a second set of ears listening to what's going on. Because sometimes you can be stuck in your own head. And I know I've done this from producing Grandpa's Hat all by myself, sitting there listening to the mix, like uh, tweaking things for hours that, you know, make no noticeable real thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you may not hear it, but I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great having a guy, uh, and Connor's really great at that. It just recommending something hearing different things and uh, sometimes he he hear things that that work that I didn't and and vice versa and we we uh, that's kind of how we crafted the the record so now that you have that out um, what what are you hoping for from this um, I'm hoping that soon I can play some shows <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> material that's uh, when that happens that's great I would love to do uh, a short tour yeah. Uh, obviously, maybe not this summer, but just to get out and play some shows. Mm -hmm. And this is really that's uh, if some people listen to it and they like it, that that's great. That's all I really uh, intend to get out of this. Um, I just see myself learning and growing as a writer and getting better and better and better. And that's that's what I'm trying to achieve. So, um, by putting out this release, it's just another stepping stone, and I'm I'm kind of looking forward to the next one by now. Yeah. Have you gotten much of a reaction so far from your release? Yeah, it's it's been amazing the local response and uh, and just fans on the web. It's been much uh, much greater than the, the release of the first EP. It's been and been really kind. Let people have a lot of nice words to say say about it. And uh, yeah, it's really cool to see getting a lot of streams and a lot of plays and yeah. and all that jazz. Nice. Is there an accompanied music video? None yet. Oh no. no. Well, she should, should be working on one here soon. Uh, I just I uh, have a lyric video for "Wind Blows" that is up on the web, but yeah. no music video yet. Uh, yeah, I gotta see. Maybe I'll just start a poll. See uh, which which song deserves a music video out of the four on the EP. Yeah. Well, uh, again, you and I work together. We both work in broadcast. You're behind the scenes. I'm in front of the microphone. Um, so you have the advantage of having a lot of creative minds as well as a lot of people, including yourself, who are tec technically savvy, are shooters, and are editors and whatnot. So, I mean, you have an incredible pool of, of uh, talent to pull from here. So, I mean, all you have to do really is pick one and yeah. then approach the right people and go hey here's my idea yeah. and <laughs> before you know it off you go exactly yeah, yeah. Look at, looking forward to doing that and hopefully we'll have one out here in the next uh, next little while yeah so w can you tell me your thoughts and the story behind these four tracks opening song uh, Wind Blows of the album like I, I mentioned earlier is a song I wrote in, in 2013 and it's one of the first songs that I've written completely and uh, it was written to impress a girl like uh, a lot of songs <laughs> that a boy <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah it was a really it's really interesting I, I always wanted to record the song and I'm really happy that it's out there mm -hmm. but it's been a song that I've been playing at shows and, 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 and just playing generally for a while now for a long time yeah 
uh, and I'm really happy to have it out there. But it was just a, a simple song. It's one of the only songs that ever happened where I just picked up the guitar, had the music, and l all the lyrics came out. Oh. It usually never never works like that for me. Uh, sometimes I'll write like two or three bad songs, and then I'll get a nice new piece of music together, and then I'll take from those bad songs the good parts, and like ah, I got something now <laughs> together in a in a chunky sort of way. Yeah, this puzzle piece belongs over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, number two uh, on the album out east, that was more of a uh, going for kind of a popular vibe, more of a, a folk country kind of a song. And again, it was one of those songs that kind of came together by uh, using other songs and, and throwing together with this uh, new piece of music. And that's just about trying to uh, trying to fix your problems that are, are inside you by doing external things like moving. <laughs> just like, I need a new change of scenery, but if you move, you, you still have the same issues, right? So yeah, yeah. that's kind of what that, uh, that song is about. Number three was co-written with a really, really good friend of mine and a very, very, very accomplished songwriter, uh, Cliff Ashton, uh, who works as a tech at Sound Factory. Amazing, amazing songwriter. And, uh, I had this piece of music, and we we were in Sound Factory, uh, and there was a Christmas party going on, and we were just hunkered down in one of the little, uh, if you remember my orange teaching room in that one, and we just wrote this whole song, and it uh, came together really nicely. Uh, and that one's about overcoming adversity, simple topic, keeping a positive mind, and... Uh, Climbing that mountain, <laughs> right? And the last uh, title track, Maylong. This one, it just um, it just reminds me of home. It reminds me of the Maylong soccer tournaments that a, a bunch of small communities can probably relate relate to. And again, it's just about about a love. It's about a girl, <laughs> and it's about uh, it's just a reminiscent song of home uh, for me. It's all all what it was trying to do, and. Uh, Trying to get how I feel about my hometown through in this one song. That's that's basically the feel of it. Reminiscing about simpler times and comfort and just exactly. being at peace with things. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I was so lucky to grow up in a beautiful place like Kiwanga. Uh, this is the Bulky Valley. It's just absolutely uh, stunning and amazing. So. Yeah. It's kind of some of that northern feel as well in that track. Just just so that, because we just talked about it, of course, where could people find uh, your music right now? Oh, for sure. Uh, a one-stop shop, you can head to carlweeson.com, K-A-R-L-W-Y-S-S-E-N. Uh, and every all the links to everything are on there, uh, links to buy the album. Of course, I'm on Bandcamp, Spotify, any place where you get your music. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Simple enough. <laughs> um, so now that now you've done this, you have already decided, you know, next time, much like moving, uh, doing it all by yourself is exhausting. I'm going to get some help. So <laughs> so session musicians uh, will be in the future. Are you already working on your next project? Yes. Uh, yes and no. I've been writing uh, constantly, and I've got a collection of maybe ten new songs, where maybe you know six or seven of them are just bad songs. They're not going to be used. <laughs> That's usually how it goes through. Pick through the good ones. Right. Uh, but also uh, for my next um, next release, uh, I think I'm going to be focusing on working with uh, my brother, my really good friend that I grew up with, Joe Joe Daniels, and he's living in town here now, and we've uh, got a bunch of material between us, a bunch of unreleased stuff. Hmm. I'm really looking forward to putting out a, a project with him uh, coming up coming up soon. So we're working on some new, some new exploring some new territories, uh, hmm. going down different routes, uh, and then I'll maybe I'll come back and do another solo Carl Wieson record. Uh, but just keeping up and 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 releasing music. It's such a thrill to create and and put out something. On, on that topic of creating, putting out something, uh, getting your word out, getting your name out, and stuff like that. Um, okay, let's. Let's let's all face facts. That right now, uh, touring, traveling, concerts, not that easy. Um, but things are starting to look up. When you get the green light and you can actually start to plot a tour, as it were, are you going to go by yourself? And are you going to rough it in a van, much like? almost any other struggling musician and successful musician has ever done in the history of time. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure answer, yes. I would, um, <clears throat> though it would be awesome to do just a solo tour, I would um, 
love to do it with uh, a bass player and a drummer and just yeah. a little trio uh, to really get the full effect of the of the songs through. And there's nothing like performing with other people. And yes, yeah, sleeping on on people's floors and vans. <laughs> 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 Tours are rough. <laughs> Tours are rough. Yeah. Have Have you seen? Uh, I, I, bringing up Dave Grohl, but my God, the guy is brilliant. Have you seen a documentary he put together recently called "What Drives Us"? No, I have not seen that one yet. I'm itching to see it, though. I got to. That so I'm not going to give anything away, but uh, the entire premise of the documentary is the musician's life and struggle and the quote-unquote rite of passage of touring in a cramped little van. Not a tour bus, not a fleet, not anything that just four musicians in a van that is way too small with instruments going <laughs> across. And it's, it is an incredible watch because yeah. he, he goes through, he tells his own story, he talks to other legends, and he also talks to some up-and-coming artists and they share stories and you know, it, it it tells how that experience being on the road and touring and struggling and all that stuff really, you know, it solidified what they were doing and it made them who they are today. Mm -hmm. It's definitely worth a watch. If you, if you, ha you haven't had a chance to watch it yet, watch it. <laughs> I, uh, it reminds me of, uh, uh, you mentioned that, it reminds me of uh, Joe and I, when we were in high school, we were in a band called Blind Vinyl, and we came down to do a couple shows uh, in Fort St. James and in Prince George, and uh, I sat in the, I shared a seatbelt with my lead singer, so we're in the very back, so we're sharing a seat, luckily he weighed like 95 pounds soaking wet, and I had a bass <laughs> drum, had a bass drum on my lap. You know, oh my god! It's probably like seven hundred clicks to Prince George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good times. Yeah, yeah, it, like I said, it it it, it grows you. It, it puts hair on your chest. <laughs> you, you learn from those experiences, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations on your most recent release, May Long. If you hadn't had a chance to get anyone out there, uh, the links are in the description down below as well. What's the website again? Uh, CarlWiesen dot com, K A R L W Y S S E N dot C O M. Cool. Thank you so much, Carl. Thanks a bunch, JD. This was fun.